number 246 246 and after this hymn we'll have our prayer
Let us bow. Dear God, we're thankful for this opportunity to come to you in prayer at this time. We're thankful that we can come to you and cast our cares at your feet, that you will listen to our petitions, that you will hear our prayer. Thank you for everything that you do for us every day, for the many blessings that you bless us with. Pray that you might continue to be with us every day in our lives. We're thankful for this church family that meets here. We pray that you'll continue to be with us as a collective group. We pray continually for our elders. We pray that you'll bless them. Pray that you'll be with us as we further worship you this morning. We pray for those that were mentioned this morning as being sick. We pray that you'll be with them and bless them and help them to get well. Also, Heavenly Father, we pray for those that are missing loved ones at this time. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you might forgive us of our sins and our trespasses against you. We know that we are sinners. And we pray that you'll help us to be stronger. Go with us now through the remainder of this service and on through whatever future life you see fit to give, give us. In the end, if we've been found faithful, we ask for that prayer with thee. Home with thee, in Christ's name, amen. amen. <clears throat> Number 43, 43, we'll have this one before our lesson. Let me invite you to stand if you would. Faith of our thunderstorming out there? Is that what that was all about? Lights were flashing a little bit. <laughs> Good singing. <clears throat> that reminds me of, um, it was just a few years ago, we were, um, I drove up 
from Childersburg to Dalton, Georgia. And um, it was the funeral for Brother Barry Gilreath Sr. And we were singing uh, one of his favorite songs as part of the congregational singing in the funeral. And I cannot remember for the life of me who was leading singing for that funeral. But uh, the song we were singing, and it was just beautiful. Barry Gilreath Sr. loved singing, and he was a great, he did a lot of singing workshops. But um, we were singing, Till the Storm Passes By. And there was a storm passing by, buddy. I mean, it was, it was intense, but it was actually a pretty neat effect to be singing that song. And it, it, the church building was just packed full of people, and it was beautiful singing. And then you could hear the thunder and uh, the rain hitting the roof, and it was just a very neat thing. Uh, before we get into the sermon this, this evening, I want to uh, mention something that came up as a part of our group activity. Let's see, we're group four, right, Brother Robert? Uh, we, the, the idea was suggested that we do something, and uh, you know, we, it's been announced at least to two or three weeks leading up to today, so you may have heard it if you're not in group four and wondered what on earth are they talking about. They keep announcing this sack lunch Sunday thing. And so Robert said he, we should charge somebody $25 if they want to know and uh, add it to the general fund there. But, but I asked him and he said it was okay for me to tell you. But here's what we, the idea was. Uh, on average, if, if you have a family of four counting children, especially as they get older, if you have a family uh, such as ours of six, and then if you figure in that you know those are fam those are kids with Campbell jeans and Dalahite jeans, which means they're going to eat a lot. Um, you, you've got to figure in, you know, I'd say minimum $30, even just for a, a cheaper place to eat. You're probably looking 40, sometimes even upwards of 45 if it's a sit-down type of restaurant. But the idea was proposed that what if one Sunday a month, instead of spending whatever it would cost your particular family, to eat out, you just brought a sandwich, brought a can of soup from home, something that you know amounts to a few cents, maybe a dollar or two uh, in groceries, bring it here to the building, eat it, and then take the money that would have been spent on that meal out and give it to a missionary who needs the support. That idea was proposed and uh, it was agreed that that would be a, a good thing to do, and so that was kind of the concept behind Sack Lunch Sunday. Uh, while we were together today, we went ahead and had our Brother's Keeper meeting, but the idea was just simply to do it together so that we're all supporting one another and we see how many people are skipping a meal out and using that money to help out the spread of the gospel. Also, uh, the idea was proposed of using that as a special time to go to God in prayer on behalf of our missionaries. Maybe decide, well, you know, discuss what are some things we can do to help them, to encourage them. And so this was, today we did that for the first time and uh, I'm, I'm just thrilled to report that uh, every, to my knowledge, and we had a couple more that were mentioned, but I believe every single one of these has been pledged to help. One person that was mentioned specifically was our very own Stephen Higley because Stephen has been in need of some extra funding uh, he, he, Stephen kind of went to New Zealand in, in a large way on faith that some of his support would come through, <laughs> that a lot of his support would come through. And he, he has been in need for a while now. And so we decided that uh, several of us said, we're, we're going to help Stephen. And so every single uh, contribution that, was, that came in as part of our Sack Lunch Sunday today was designated for Stephen Higley's work in New Zealand. And we, uh, we have $560. I think if you want to be technical, 557 but I round it up. So uh, <laughs> we got $560 raised that we're going to be sending to Brother Higley. Uh, I know Martin and Connie will probably be talking to him soon, so you let him know that's going to be on the way, and I know that will help him um, in, in a very big way in the work that he's doing there. It's, it's, you know, Robert was talking to me today and talking about how that frees a missionary up in a lot of ways to think more about how can I do my work of evangelism. When you're worried about finances, that can consume you because, uh, you know, it's just, that's a, that's a stressful thing. So we're, we're happy about that. And, you know, somebody said in our group, and I, I, I believe that they're right, they said they, they didn't figure that any other of the Brothers Keepers groups could probably come close to that. And I don't, I don't think they can, Brother Robert. I don't think there's a Brothers Keeper group out there that could beat what Group 4 has raised. So, you know, y'all can, 
Uh, Y'all can do with that what you will, but that's our theory. Uh, And I also just wanted to mention that we have coming up, uh, we had a meeting today for Vacation Bible School. That is just on the horizon in July. And also our summer series will be beginning in June. Those are two things that uh, young folks and older folks keep in mind just by way of just reminding us to be inviting friends. Uh, These are going to be some excellent teaching opportunities, especially as regards to the summer series. The summer series is going to be on why we are members of the Church of Christ. You know, you may may have somebody ask you, it may just come out and ask the question, well, why are you a member of the Church of Christ as opposed to whatever? Uh, I've got friends who were brought up in the Baptist Church and the Methodist Church and other different denominations. And somebody say, now, you know, look, I'm confused. I mean, you grew up in this church, and, and, you know, if you all grew up in the South, you're like me, and you know how it is. In the South, it's kind of viewed as you go to church where you were raised, where you were brought up. And so to go against that, you know, the first question that people want to know is, why would you do that? Uh, You know, people generally have a reason for that. Well, there is a reason. Why are we members of the Church of Christ. And we're going to answer that in a series of 12 lessons. Of course, the 13th will be uh, Vacation Bible School Week, and we'll have a guest speaker that week, but it won't, it won't be centered around that why we're members of the Church of Christ theme. So keep that in mind. There's, there are at least three, I believe I counted three, that are going to be excellent, uh, that I'm especially excited about, just because uh, I've, I've heard one of them before. I know another brother very well, and I know two of those brothers very well, but one of them is Leroy Dedman. Most of us here know Leroy. Uh, He preached here many years ago, but Leroy is going to tell, Leroy was one that he grew up with parents who were members of the Baptist Church, and so he's going to tell, well, how did he end up attending the Church of Christ as opposed to the Baptist Church? He's going to tell, as as he calls it, he says, it's my story and how how that happened. Uh, So that's, that's a very interesting thing, and he's just going to look at how he studied the Bible and what, you know, what he learned. Uh, a similar theme, and these will be spaced out, so they're not going to be back to back, but Thomas Broom. Um, Yvonne Broom Allen goes to West Georgia, and that's his daughter, right? Y'all have to, y'all have to remind me of these family connections. Spencer is who I'm thinking of. That's his son, right? Uh, so anyway, Brother Broom's going to be here. I, when I was still at GBN, Leroy handed me a tape one day. It was just a VCR tape, and he says, you need to watch this sometime. And I watched it, and I was just blown away by that man's story. Unbelievable. And so I told Leroy, I said, we got to get that on GBM. We couldn't use what what he had handed me because it wasn't good enough quality. But another brother ended up making a production of that and put it on GBN, and it's fantastic. But Brother Broom's going to come and tell his story of how he ended up in the Lord's Church. And then another brother is Wesley Simons. Uh, Wesley Simons is director of the Tri-City School of Preaching up in the Tri-Cities area, northeast corner of Tennessee. And Wesley, if you've never met or heard Wesley, he's a great, great gospel preacher. But he and his cousin, Eddie Kraft, they do a radio program up there. It's called Rise to Truth, and you can actually pull it up on the Internet. I forget what days it's on. But uh, you, can, you can Google a Rise to Truth radio program or something like that and find it. But Wesley, they have, they have converted by means of that radio program and studying the gospel with po- folks about seven, maybe seven, maybe as many as ten denominational preachers that have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ and left denominationalism altogether to follow pure, non-denominational, anti-denominational, pre-denominational New Testament Christianity uh, because of that radio program and the, the good work that they're doing. Um, I don't even know how many folks that were, you know, what we would, might call regular members, for lack of a better term, that they have helped to obey the gospel. But to me, the amazing number is the number of preachers, uh, because, uh, you know, sometimes preachers can be hard-headed. <laughs> but uh, keep those things in mind. Summer Series, VBS, and uh, the Sack Lunch Sunday, if you, if you think you can beat Group 4's uh, money that we have raised to help out a missionary. And, and we, we laugh about the competition, but... Seriously, it is a good work. Anytime we can help the spread of the gospel, that is a wonderful thing. I say it so many times. If we ever stop being about evangelism, then we might as well close the doors. It's just a social institution at that point. But the Lord's Church is not just a social institution. We gain a lot of social benefits from the fellowship that we have one with another. And that was one of the great things about Sack Lunch Sunday. We just got to spend some time visiting. But if it ever stops being about evangelism, it's just a social club.
But when we are concerned about souls, then it's so much more than that. We're making a difference in eternity. All right, that being said, let's turn to your, the, uh, if you've got your Bible, turn to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 30. Should have given one of these young men a microphone. I could have had somebody reading. But I'll do it since I'm the only one with a microphone, I guess. I didn't even think about that till now. Let's, let's look at, um, begin at verse 24, and just, just notice what he says here. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet they make their houses in the rocks. The locusts have no king, yet go they forth all of them by bands. The spider taketh hold with their hands and is in king's palaces. We're talking tonight about some things that are little. Now, I'm going to step over here to the side. I hope the mic will still pick me up. <laughs> what is it uh, Rachel would say, nerd alert here? Um, I'm, I'm a Lord of the Rings fan. And if you ever watch Lord of the Rings and you watch the stuff that's after the movie, you know, all the extra stuff, then you, you, you learn a little bit about how they're making this. Well, if, if you've ever seen the movie, Minas Tirith is one of the cities, the, the white city, and you can see, here's a guy standing, and this is the city, and there, here's a dude up on a ladder. But it's, uh, they actually use the term, not miniature, they call it a bigature, because it's bigger than most movie miniatures, but it is still small. If you watch the movie, and you see this city in the shots, it looks like this humongous city. In fact, uh, th this part here is a, is a whole mountain when you see it in the movie. And it's just the way they're filming it, using angles and stuff like that. And that's, uh, that, some of that stuff is fascinating to me, but I don't always understand how they do it. But they, they, they can film this, and then they put a, a blue screen back here, or a green screen, as the case may be, and then they can just put whatever background they want. So they can put a nice, pretty blue sky back behind it, or they can put a dark, ominous black sky behind it, whatever they want. Uh, when we were at GBN, they had a set that was the Good News Today set, and uh, there were windows in this set. Well, they didn't have windows in it. It was just, it looked like windows. Uh, but behind it, you know, here in the, behind me, we have, you know, the baptistry. There's a painting back there on the wall. But instead of having something like that, we just hung a blue screen back there when we weren't using it. And so sometimes just for kicks, Sam, one of the video editors, would go and, uh, and we didn't ever air this, of course, on GBN, but sometimes Sam for kicks would have a horde of orcs roaming uh, on the background of the Good News Today set. And you'd have Jim Dearman sitting there talking and reading the Bible and, and there's orcs in the background or something, you know. And so, uh, but you could put whatever you want back there. But they take these miniature sets and they use their, you know, little compared to a real live city or, uh, or thing, as whatever the case may be. But there's so much that they can do with that. And that's a, one, an amazing thing. But we're looking in, in Proverbs 30 at things that are little. And sometimes you can look at things that are little and you can learn a lot. Sometimes little kids can teach us a whole lot, right? Sometimes little small things teach us a lot. And that's what we're going to be looking at here in Proverbs chapter 30. Notice, of course, there's four things that he mentions here. The ants are mentioned in verse 25. What do ants teach us? I think the big lesson we can learn from ants is hard work. Have you ever seen anything work like an ant? The only thing I can think that compares really much that I've seen is, would be bees, the worker bees. Worker bees and worker ants are very similar. Is that one's flying and one's crawling. But they, they center their lives around a queen, and they work, 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 and just practically wear themselves out in work, in service to the queen. Now, Christians, we, we center our lives around the King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. And we ought to be wearing ourselves out for him. Now, he understands that we need rest. In Mark 6, 31, he even told the disciples to come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and take a rest, take a break. But our lives center around service, hard work. 
Proverbs 6, 6 to 8. The wise man there says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. If you're a lazy person, look at the ant. Study the ant. Consider her ways and be wise, he says. Who, having no guide, overseer, or ruler, there's nobody cracking a whip, in other words, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. He says, look at the ants, and they'll teach you. I mean, here's a, you know, not, not being, not trying to be rude to ants, but, but these are dumb animals. They, they don't have intelligence, but look, what do they do? Work, work, work. And yet here are intelligent human beings, and sometimes we find ourselves doing everything we can to get out of work, as opposed to working for the Lord. What a lesson we can learn from the ants. Jesus himself says, John 9, 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. Why, Jesus? He says, because the night cometh when no man can work. Night is coming. Night is the end of life, and more specifically, the end of opportunity. And so we need to work while we have the opportunity. What can I be doing for the Lord here on this earth? I heard a guy, he actually preached a sermon on this one time. I thought it was pretty creative. I can't come up with creative things like this, but some folks are good at it. But he, he, the, the title of the sermon is what, let me see if I can get it right. What on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? And he talks about what are you doing here on this earth for heaven's sake, on behalf of heaven? It's a good question. Well, you look at the ants and they teach us about work. Nehemiah 4, 6. You study that great book. Boy, if we had more time, we could just go dissect the book of Nehemiah. There's a whole book that shows the benefits of hard work in a worthy project. And there, of course, a project of God's making, of God's doing. But it, Nehemiah says, so built we the wall, and the wall was joined together into the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. When we have a mind to work, we can accomplish great things. The time in which they built that wall is amazing. But they did it because they had a mind to work. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10, the wise man there says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Give it everything you got, is what we would say in our day and age. When you find something to do that, and of course it's understood that he's talking about something that is right and that is acceptable in God's sight. When you put your hand to the plow, give it everything. And that goes, we talked about that this morning with Luke 9, 62. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. When you put your hand to that plow, give it everything. I, I tell my children, you know, whether it's uh, the end of the season and you're sick of it, maybe you've, you've been playing a sport or uh, maybe it's something with the band, whatever it may be, and you may say, man, I am so tired of this. You know, when, when, when I was a supervisor there at GBN, sometimes we talk about a fellow getting short-timers disease, and, you know, you probably see that in your own workplaces. Sometimes a guy's put in his two-week notice, and about that last week, he just pretty much might as well not be there. In fact, Leroy and I got together one day, and we just went and told a fellow, we said, hey, look, I don't, I don't remember you taking too much vacation time. Here's your next week's pay. Why don't you just go ahead and take off? I mean, it, it, was, it was a bad case of short-timers, and we didn't want the morale dip rubbing off on the other employees. But God says, when you find something to do that's worth doing, it's a good thing, give it everything. Don't just kind of fizzle out at the end. Don't decide, well, I'll wait until it counts. Well, you know, sometimes when I'd play on sports teams, we have guys that, uh, when, when we played hockey up there in Chattanooga, that regular season didn't matter as much. If, if there were just a few teams in the league, they knew they had a pretty good shot of making the playoffs. They'd win just enough games to get to the playoffs. Then they'd decide they're going to start trying. But God says, from start to finish, especially in spiritual matters, more so than anything, from start to finish, you give 100%. And he says, look at the ant, if you need an example of that. They don't say, well, you know, we're getting pretty close to being full. Let's slack off a little, boys. Let's knock off early today. No, they, they go full tilt from start to finish. Ants teach us about work. He mentions the conies in verse 26. This would be, you know, I've got the pictures there of the rabbit just, just for, I guess, illustration's sake. It would be something similar to a rabbit. I don't know that it would be, that's an exact apples to apples comparison, but something similar to that. What do we learn from the conies? 
I think we can learn a lesson of acknowledging our own weaknesses and seeking refuge. We learn from the ants the value of, of hard work. And you know, even when we're small, again, we're learning from things that are little, the Lord's church is small among the world. I mean, you consider the world's population and you consider how many Christians there are in the world. And then even, you know, you're, you're even taking that number and having to go smaller because not all Christians are faithful Christians. Even some that say they're faithful, but they're living like the world. And so it's a small number. Jesus says, you know, straight is the gate that leads unto life and few there be that find it. And so we know the, the number of the saved are small, little. But we can learn that even small in number, we can do big things when we work hard. But from the Coneys, we learn about acknowledging our weaknesses and seeking refuge from the Lord. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, I love these verses. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory by the church in Christ Jesus throughout all the ages, world without end. He can do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. You know, sometimes it's easy to get to thinking, well, I did such and such. Uh, I did this and I did that. And, and sometimes even congregationally, we can forget about that. And, I, you know, you can even see congregations sometimes get kind of puffed up with pride. And, well, we've done this and we've done that. Let's understand that when all is said and done, you and I are tools in the hand of the master. We're just tools in his hand. We're servants. But oh, what great things we can do when we put ourselves in the master's hand. And we say, here am I, Lord, send me. We can do great things when we acknowledge our weaknesses and we say, you know, sometimes... We have the, the situation of trying to do something, trying to do something. We say, you know, it, it can't be done. And it's almost like you look at the Lord and you say, Lord, I can't do this. And you can almost picture God. Of course, we know he's not speaking directly from heaven today. But through his word, in principle at least, he says to us, exactly, Chad, you can't do that. But I can. And now if you're ready to step aside and let me use you, then we'll accomplish great things together. Let's acknowledge our weaknesses and seek refuge. You know, the little conies, these little rabbits or similar type creatures that you see out in the mountainous areas, you know, if a coyote or whatever comes out, if some kind of predator comes after them, they don't come out and say, you know what, this is it. I'm, I'm not being bullied anymore. I'm coming out and I'm going to fight. You ever see a rabbit do that? You ever see a rabbit just turn around and decide, you know what, let's go. I'm going I'm to take on this coyote or, um, you know, I got a cat. That, that's, a, that's a sweet little cat out there that uh, somehow managed to make it from Childersburg, Alabama here to Bremen with us. But uh, that's the sweetest little cat. You know, most cats kind of don't want to be around you too much. That cat loves attention and loves affection, but she's a killer. I'm just going to tell you. I mean, every other day there's something, and, you know, cats love to bring it and show it to you. And so uh, you're having to dispose of carcasses all the time. But she got a rabbit one time. I mean, a rabbit, big, about as big as she is. But, you know, I've never seen whether it's a cat, coyote, whatever. I've never seen a rabbit turn around and say, this is it. I'm not going to be bullied by you anymore. And I'm, I'm going to fight. You know, a rabbit knows better than that. They're smarter than that. They acknowledge their weaknesses. And when they're in trouble, where do they go? They flee for refuge. They go to their hole, to their hiding place, and they seek refuge. Um, turn, turn to Psalm chapter 46. Shouldn't be too far away from where we are there in Proverbs 30. We won't read this entire psalm, but there's several good thoughts here about this idea of seeking refuge and acknowledging our weaknesses, because that's exactly what the psalmist is doing here. Notice verse 1, God is our refuge, and that's what we're talking about here. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Well, God is our refuge. We're not our own refuge. We're not going to stand and uh, conquer the world all on our own. God is our strength. We're acknowledging our weaknesses. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Drop on down to 
Verse 5, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her in that right early. The Lord of hosts is with us, verse 7. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Then notice verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. What a comforting thought that the God of Jacob is our refuge. But we learn from these coney type creatures to acknowledge our weaknesses and to seek for refuge. It's not what we have accomplished. It is what God through us has accomplished. Anything good that is done, it is God working through us. Notice next, locusts. The wise man mentions locusts. These are little bitty creatures. I mean, you know, they're, they're about the size of, I guess the locust is more, probably a little bit bigger than a grasshopper, but not a whole lot bigger than a grasshopper. And, you know, I, I don't, there are all kind of different types of locusts, but, you know, again, I'm going for an illustration type thing there so I don't know that I'm getting exactly right but we're familiar with locusts what do we learn from locusts I think you can learn a lesson of unity you know there's not a locust who says uh, I'm tired of flying at the back of the swarm I want to be at the front of the swarm and today I go and I move out on my own and I'm going to do this thing all by myself there's no locust singing on Broadway or wherever that I did it my way they unite and boy, if you've ever seen their work, you know they unite. Uh, it is amazing what locusts can do in such a short time. In fact, um, I saw a video, it's, it's been a few months ago, but somebody sent it, some guy was over somewhere in the Middle East, and they had a, just a ridiculous locust swarm, and so he just, and he's driving along one day, and he said it, it was, he said it was almost to the point where you couldn't drive because it was so many swarms, and they're just hitting the windshield, and so he says, we stopped the vehicle, and he got out of some kind of a cell phone uh, video. He's using his cell phone camera to video, and it, it was amazing what, what you could see on that video as far as the number of locusts that there were. Just unbelievable, these things that, that we call locusts. But they show unity. You know Matthew 12, 25, where Jesus says, every kingdom divided against itself, it, it shall not stand. Every, every city or house divided against itself, it can't stand. You know, they'd accuse Jesus. Oh, he's, he's casting out demons by the prince of the demons. And he says that's ridiculous because that would mean Satan's divided against himself. And that's obviously going nowhere real fast. But he says, if I cast out demons by the power of God, then you know that the kingdom has come near. But they wouldn't acknowledge that. Jesus says a house divided against itself, it can't stand. Whether you're talking congregationally, family unit, whatever it may be, we need to look at the locusts and learn about unity. You want to see what locusts can do, just, just take a look sometime at Exodus chapter 10 and see the damage. I mean, they, you know, they just about blot out the sun, there are so many of them. And again, if you think it's ridiculous, just ask somebody who's ever been in a locust swarm to tell you how thick those things can get when they're swarming. Ephesians 4 3 tells us as Christians endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Now we could just about go off on a whole other direction and preach a sermon on unity. The true unity of God is not unity and diversity. It's not agreeing to disagree and that's what a lot of times is the politically correct idea. Well let's just agree to disagree and and you and I will We'll say we're going to heaven but by different paths. And it always amazes me that people say things like that when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way, that's, that's path, road. All those are synonymous terms and Jesus says, I'm the only one. And yet so many times you hear people in the religious world and they say, we're, we're all going to heaven just by different paths. No, we're not. We can't be. Because there's one path that leads to heaven. And folks, I want to be on that. And if I'm going to be on it, I'm going to have to read in the Bible and follow his plan. And so we could talk about keeping the unity of the Spirit, not manufacturing it. And that's what's going on today a lot in the religious world. There's this manufactured unity. That's fake. That's not true unity. 
Paul says you keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. True unity is Psalm 133, verse 1, where he says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. When brethren dwell together in unity, that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. You think what this congregation can do if we are united. John 17, 20 and 21, Jesus praying there, Neither pray I for these alone, he's praying to the Father, of course, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Those who are going to believe on Jesus through the words of the apostles, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may be one in us. Why, Jesus? That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. You want to do as much damage, and believe you me, Satan wants to do as much damage as possible to the cause of Christ. You want to damage the cause of Christ, then start splintering, dividing that unity of the Spirit. Start manufacturing some pseudo-unity and calling it unity. And you see how quickly people in the world say such things as, and maybe it sounds familiar, <laughs> You folks can't even get along with one another. And you expect me to believe that's right? You hear statements like that sometimes, don't you? That doesn't make it okay. Those people are still going to have to stand before an all-powerful God Almighty one day on the Day of Judgment and give an account for that behavior and that lack of obedience. But at the same time, if we don't endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit, we are hindering God's message. And if we, if we think for a moment that we're not, we're just kidding ourselves. That's the quickest way to hinder the gospel message is division. And Satan knows it. That's why he's worked so hard to get the religious world as divided as they are. You say, well, how do we fix that? Keeping the true unity of the Spirit, you're only going to find it in one place. You know, you say, well, do we need to go to Billy Graham? Do we need to go to this guy? Do we need to go to that guy? I tell you, we need to go to this guy right here, Jesus Christ. That's who we need to go to if you want the, the unity of the Spirit. We're going to find his words in the New Testament. But we learn from the locusts, they band together. And again, go to Exodus 10. You see the damage they did to Egypt's crops. And, and you have the people there telling Pharaoh, we're destroyed. Let those people go. I mean, now he's got his own servant saying, please, just let them go. We can't take much more of this. Unity. No limit to what we can accomplish when we're unified. But you know what? The reverse of that is true as well. There's almost no limit to the harm that can be done to the cause of Christ if we are not unified. That's why it is so important for you and I, congregationally speaking, to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. Notice what Paul says there, endeavor. It takes work. You know why? Because y'all are hard to get along with sometimes. Now, not me. I'm, I'm just perfect. And, I, you know, that's the way we look at it, isn't it? But you know what? I'm hard to get along with sometimes. And so are you. And so is everybody because we're human. And so that's why the Holy Spirit has Paul right endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Because sometimes it's not easy. It's going to take work. But, boy, the things we can accomplish. We learn about that from locusts. That lesson of unity. And then let's notice finally from spiders. Well, what do we learn from spiders? I think the big lesson we can take from spiders is persistence. Now, you know, I don't even know what these spiders are. Uh, there, there's a certain kind of spider. Oh, it almost came to me. Uh, my buddy Brent Rice is a, a real uh, outdoorsman. I, I, I jokingly call him the Bear Grylls of Alabama because he is, uh, he's just so outdoorsy. He can, he can look at a snake and immediately tell you what kind of snake it is. And, uh, you know, I'm, the only kind of snake I don't recognize is, is live and dead. And I want it. If it's alive, I want it dead. <laughs> but uh, but he, he's that kind of person. And he, he, he told me one time what these, what these particular spiders are called. But sometimes we would notice at camp or out on the back porch at home or something, you see these big webs. I mean, they'd be two or three feet across. Humongous webs. And, you know, the light hits them just right, and you can see, and they're so pretty. They're very intricately weaved, intricately woven. I don't know. But, uh, 
we would come up and we'd look at that thing and we'd say, boy, that's, that's nice, isn't it? And we'd come up, and I don't know why, but we just got the biggest kick when I was a kid. We'd take a little stick and just go, boink, boink. And we just plucking those things one by one. And next thing you know, that thing's flopping in the wind. That spider's out there, you know, and you can almost hear him screaming at you. But you pluck that thing, and, you know, once you're done, that thing finally falls and the wind blows, and it all kind of tangles up. But well, then you're done with it. You know, fun's over, so you leave. And you know what would happen, strangely, almost every time? You come back the next day and go, didn't, didn't, we, didn't we do this yesterday we took this thing down? He's built it back. Well, you know what we were going to do? We got another stick. We start plucking them again. It's just fun, you know. But you know what? That spider didn't after two or three times say, hey, I'm sick of this. And I'm not building anymore. I quit. Yeah, spiders don't do that. You tear down the web, what do they do? They spin another one. They don't get mad. They don't quit. They don't talk bad about, you know, why has this not ever happened to old John over there? They just keep on keeping on. I think there's something we can learn from that, isn't there? Galatians 6, 9, Paul says, as we have, well, that's verse 10, actually. He says, in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. Let's don't grow weary in well-doing. Because in due season, we shall reap if, and there's that condition, if we faint not. The spiders, you, you tear down that web, they just keep going. They don't faint. They don't quit. And that's the idea. That's one of those expressions that maybe we don't understand as well in our day and age. I think we get it. But, uh, you know, we might say, in due season we shall reap if we just hang in there. That might be a good southern way of putting it. In due season we shall reap if we hang in there. Well, the spider's the same way. He knows he's just going to keep hanging in there. He's just going to keep on spinning that web. He's persistent. Revelation 2.10, one of the most well-known verses, probably most of us, if not all of us here know it, the latter part of that verse at least, where he says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. What is he saying? Be faithful up to death, or be faithful till you die? Yes, on both accounts. There, I think there's a, an aspect of both of those in there. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Just keep on keeping on. When life comes at you and just very maliciously like a little 10, 11 year old boy plucking down your spider web and Satan's grinning as he watches your life just flopping in the breeze just don't worry about it just keep building I know that's easier said than done but persistence we're not going to let it get us down one of my favorite verses is 1 Corinthians 15 58, Paul has had this great treatise, this great chapter on the resurrection and he says, wherefore, my beloved brethren, he's wrapping it up, last verse of that chapter. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You know what those spiders often did when we took down their spider webs? Not only did they pretty much always build another spider web or rebuild the one they had before, many times they built it bigger and better. They were abounding in their work. They were steadfast and persistent, unmovable. You're not going to get them to give up like that. And they were abounding in their work. And that's what Paul says. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why does he say that, though? For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It's not for nothing. In due season we shall reap if we just hang in there. What a lesson that we learn from the spiders. Well, as we close out our thoughts here, let's make sure that it's never the case that Luke 16, 8 would apply to us. I hope this will never be the case for the congregation here or for you individually either for that matter. But it says there in that verse, the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. But you know, you see it sometimes when with the ants, we learn from them hard work. Sometimes you see the children of this generation, this world, that are harder workers than God's people. And what's wrong with us when that seems to be the case? You think about the conies and acknowledging their weakness. You know, sometimes there are people in this world and they'll acknowledge, I, I can't do this, I'm going to go and seek help here and there and wherever. And yet here we are sometimes trying to do everything on our own. We never bother to fall to our knees and ask God for help. 
We never bother to go to our brethren and ask for help. Let's learn from those conies. Acknowledge our weaknesses. Seek help. Seek refuge. Locus, the unity. Sometimes you see more unity among the children of this world than you do the children of the spiritual world. Let's make sure that we do everything we can. We understand sometimes you do all you can, and some, sometimes other folks are bent on division. And sometimes you, you can't be united with spiritual error. But let's make sure we do everything on our part to be united, learning from the locusts. And then the spiders, learn from them on the persistence. Boy, there are so many people in this world, they're not Christians. Sometimes they're not even really people that are trying to live a moral life. But they are persistent. They don't give up. And shame on us when, as God's people, we let ourselves become discouraged that easily. May it never be so. Learn from things that are little. There are times when things that are little can teach us big lessons. You know, there's something little that it takes to become a Christian. At least it's, it's not something complicated. Obeying the gospel is a matter of believing that Jesus is the Savior of the world turning away from your sins, confessing his name as Lord, and then you're buried, baptized, immersed in the watery grave of baptism. When we're brought up out of the water, we're raised to walk in newness of life, Romans 6, 3, and 4 tells us. That's a simple thing. It's little. It's not a major, you know, it's not like you've got to go on a religious pilgrimage. You've got to accomplish these great acts of penance. It's nothing like that. It's just coming to Jesus in simple faith, saying, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and having your sins washed away, in baptism. He'll add you to his church when you do that, Acts 2, 47. A little thing, but the results are huge. Your name's written in heaven's book of life. Brother or sister in Christ, if you've wandered astray, it's a little thing to get forgiveness. You can come and it's just a matter of simply saying three little words. I have sinned. I need prayers. I need encouragement. Maybe you're not in a situation where you're in sin. Maybe you just say, you know what, I'm I'm struggling right now, and I want to stay strong. I want to stay faithful. It's a little thing to come and say, brethren, please pray for me, but the results are huge. It's not always easy to be a faithful Christian, but it is and always will be worth it. Are you a faithful child of God? If not, we extend heaven's invitation. Won't you come as we stand and sing? Thank you, Chad, for those fine lessons today. For those that are visiting, you're our honored guests. We're so glad that each of you are here with us tonight. We invite you back at every opportunity you have to be with us. Our next 
appointed time here will be Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, and we hope to see everybody here at that time. Remind you of those that we mentioned this morning on our prayer list. We've had a few additions since that time. You asked to remember uh, Brother Jim Murrell, who continues in the hospital uh, in dire condition in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, awaiting a heart transplant. Certainly our prayer is with Brother Murrell and his family. You're also asked to remember Dee Harbison. This is a friend of our Katie Flanagan. She's having some tests upcoming, some health difficulties, and she has to be remembered in our prayer. Also, uh, Louise Smith, this is Louise Smith. This is Joyce Presley's mother. She is having some difficulties as well, and she does request our prayer. You're also asked to remember uh, Sister Bill Yu as she continues in the uh, uh, Oaks assisted, assisted Living Facility. She was hopeful of going home, but they're going to hang her. She's going to stay there for some time, and uh, she also needs our encouragement. So if you have opportunity to visit with her, she would be very thankful. Shirley Smallwood was able to be here this morning, and she's also here again tonight. We're glad to see her, but Sister Shirley continues some treatments, and we're hopeful that these treatments will be successful so that she can avoid surgical procedure. Are there others that we should mention? Hopefully you've made plans to uh, hang around for just a few minutes after the evening service. Uh, as immediately after we conclude and have our closing prayer, jo Brother Johnny will come up and have a presentation of the uh, most recent events of Last to Leaders. Hopefully you want to stick around for that. We'll also have an ice cream social immediately after our services tonight in the Fellowship Hall. If you have yet to make plans to stay for that, we would invite you to do so. Next Sunday, Lord willing, we will recognize our graduates. I failed to mention that this morning, but uh, we do have uh, two graduates that we will recognize. Um, Sister Lloyd. I'm trying to remember. Pardon? Lauren. Lauren, thank you so much. Momentary lapse of uh, memory. And Jake Reeves, I, I remember that one. So Jake, leave. Jake Reeves and Lauren Lloyd will be recognized next Sunday uh, as our uh, graduates. So if you have uh, plans to attend to that, certainly we would invite you to do so. Other events I wish to bring your attention. Group three, Jake and Julie's group, will meet Saturday, June the 1st at the home of Eric and Mary Blank. That'll be at 6 o'clock. Bremen's Week at Camp Anagahi will be upcoming very soon, June 16th through 22nd. If you have yet to register, please do so ASAP. Get a registration form in the foyer or go to the website, campanagahi.org. Any questions, ask Brother Johnny. Sunday, June 2nd, after the evening services, Group 2, Ricky and Cindy's group, will meet at the home of Ken and Phyllis Glover. Right, Ricky? We'll meet at the home of Ken and Phyllis Glover Sunday, June 2nd, after evening services, Group 2. Two gospel meetings that began today in the area. Uh, one at South Cobb, Brother David Decker is the speaker through May 22nd. There's also a gospel meeting that began today at Lithia Springs. Brother Bobby Liddell will be uh, conducting that meeting. Uh, we'll plan, Lord willing, for the van to go on Tuesday. If you wish to go on the van, please let Brother Jimmy or myself know so that we can make that available for going to that meeting on Tuesday. There will be no area-wide singing for this month. We had originally planned for it to be late May, but with all the graduations and Memorial Day and so forth, there will be no area-wide singing for the month of May. Lithia Springs has agreed to host it the last Friday of June, which is the 28th. Lithia Springs also planning to host a dynamic deacon seminar for elders, deacons, ministers, and servant-hearted saints. For those that are our current deacons, elders, and those who hopefully will be employed in that capacity one day, we'd ask you to make plans to be there. That's Saturday, June the 22nd. More information about that as we get a little bit closer to it. Lord's Supper is kept prepared for those that wish to observe it. Once we send this in, go through this door, second door on the left, and there will be someone there waiting to serve you. Again, our next service, Wednesday at 7. Should we mention anything else? Final song, brother. 103. 103 is our final song. After that, we'll have our closing prayer, and then we'll ask you to hang around for the last of the leaders' presentations shortly thereafter. <laughs> I want to be a worker for the Lord. I want to love and trust the Holy Word. I want to sing and pray and be His every day in the vineyard of the Lord. I will work, I will pray in the vineyard of the Lord.
each day and we thank you for the church here in Bremen and the opportunity that we have to have a place to come to and worship with you. We thank you for the elders here and we thank you for Brother Chad that he brings us the lessons that we can apply to our everyday life. We ask you to be with the sick and shut-ins that were unable to attend services today. We ask you to be with the lost in the wake of the storms that happened in Texas this past week. Let's just remember them in our prayers. We ask you to remember the servicemen and women here at home and abroad that they can return back to their families safe. These prayers we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for staying. This is great. Wow, we got a high percentage of folks staying for our presentation this evening, and I really appreciate that. Uh, and it, is, it means a lot to our young people and to our Lads to Leaders program. Um, I appreciate the lesson that Chad had this evening about little things that work real hard. And we had some little things in the Lads to Leaders program uh, that worked really hard. Our study this year came from the book of Proverbs. And we learned that uh, pretty well, and they availed themselves of that knowledge very well at convention in lots of ways uh, that you will see from our presentation here. So we had 19 the young people that participated in Lads to Leaders this, this year, and I would like for those of them that are here tonight, just to go ahead and stand up for a second and let everybody look at you just for a minute. Okay, y'all look at them. Okay, now you can quit looking at them. Thank you for uh, participating. And then we had uh, all of their parents and those who helped uh, with the program as well and went to convention and were judges. And I won't ask all of y'all to stand up. Just raise your hand and wave. Those of you with, uh, come on, Lee. There she is. All right. Uh, and we had a great, we had a great time. I have 120 slides to show you tonight so we're going to move through them pretty quick and I will come in as needed. What you see here is the banners that we had this year. We competed in the banner competition with the help of Miss Tammy and 